Thank you very much for that very informative uh, introduction, uh, Christian. And I want to I want to thank you actually uh, for uh, hosting uh, hosting me uh, last couple of days, and you've been very generous uh, with your with your time and your energy. Uh, and I've really enjoyed meeting uh, you and, and many other folks here in, in the department um, and hearing about your, your research work and the wonderful uh, work that's going on in anxiety disorders here in uh, Stockholm. Um, and I am leaving tomorrow morning and um, we'll look forward hopefully to coming back one day. I got to bring my wife here because uh, this is just a, a wonderful uh, city and I just feel uh, really good about my, my visit. Um, I also understand that this is the room where the Nobel Assembly uh, meets, or the, this is the building where the Nobel Assembly meets, and so I'm very privileged to, uh, to be uh, lecturing here, and I have a feeling this will probably be the only time that my name is ever mentioned in this, uh, in this room. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will do my best. What we're going to do is very briefly, I have one slide just to kind of put everything in context, talk a little bit about um, just briefly where we are with DSM-4 uh, with the anxiety disorders for some of you who might not be as familiar uh, with those. And then we're going to talk about some of the proposed changes uh, that are suggested for DSM-5. There are work groups right now uh, that have submitted proposed uh, diagnostic criteria, and, and some of these changes are, are fairly significant, and some of them are, are not. We're going to talk about the significant ones uh, today, and we're going to talk about four issues uh, that I think shed some light on what Christian was talking about with respect to how do we classify these disorders. Uh, is it important to look at topography? Is it important to look at uh, psychological processes and function? Uh, of behavior. So we'll, we'll deal with that as it relates to four issues, one having to do with uh, the status of OCD as an anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, or is that a, a separate uh, set of disorders? Um, we'll talk about agoraphobia and how that's related to panic disorder. Uh, we'll talk about hoarding and whether that is a symptom of OCD or not. And we'll talk about uh, hypochondriasis uh, and whether that is an anxiety disorder. So just very briefly, uh, this is just the current list of disorders uh, that are classified as anxiety disorders in the uh, DSM-4, DSM-4-TR, I guess, is what we have now. And let's talk about some of the major proposed changes. There, there are some other changes that I won't talk about that have to do with the wording of uh, different criteria, um, but more or less uh, minor. The, the major uh, Proposed changes, one of them has to do with, as I said, removing OCD from the anxiety disorders and creating a new group of disorders called the obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit, what that would entail and some of the trials and tribulations of, of doing that. Uh, there is a, um, uh, an idea to merge panic disorder with agoraphobia and panic disorder without agoraphobia into one condition that would just be called panic disorder. So either whether or not you have agoraphobia, but then uh, you would have agoraphobia as a separate uh, condition that you could be uh, diagnosed with. And now there's also a move to uh, consider the addition of new uh, disorders. And it's unclear whether these will be actually diagnosable in the new DSM or whether some of these will be proposed as disorders for future research, perhaps to be included in future DSMs. And I'm going to talk about these in, in more detail. Hoarding disorder, uh, something called olfactory reference syndrome, which I've been an anxiety uh, researcher and clinician for over 10 years now. And I am actually, until the last year or so, really have not been familiar with this uh, condition at all. Um, and then skin picking disorder. So let's talk about, first, let's talk about the proposed criteria uh, for hoarding disorder. And we'll talk a little bit about the, what the diagnostic criteria, uh, I'm sorry, a, a case example to kind of illustrate this, because it's a little confusing. Uh, what's the difference between hoarding disorder versus OCD, especially if you've thought about hoarding as OCD? And so the main criteria would be persistent difficulty discarding or parting with personal possessions, even those of apparently useless or limited value, due to the strong urge to save these items or distress or indecision uh, about throwing these items away. And the symptoms have to result in the accumulation of a large number of possessions that fill up and clutter living areas of the home, workplace, uh, or other personal surroundings. So basically, these people cannot function. Uh, most of them, it's in their home. Uh, they can't go into rooms. Uh, they can't, uh, there are no chairs available. There's stuff even piled on their bed. They're sleeping on the floor. Sometimes it gets in the way of, of the bathroom habits. 
And sometimes you have people who occasionally uh, you go into their homes and their uh, living space is somewhat less cluttered for the time being, but that's usually because other people have come in and they've tried to help the person to declutter, to get rid of some of this um, stuff that they've got. Uh, or in even sadder cases, while the person's out of the house, uh, somebody comes in and you know, trashes all their stuff for them. And usually the person comes back and doesn't like that too much. And then, of course, the obligatory C, D, and E criteria. The symptoms have to cause, cause clinically significant distress. The hoarding symptoms aren't just due to a general medical condition. And in fact, there are cases where people have brain injuries or they develop some sort of a, uh, a brain disease, and then they start to hoard. So we want to distinguish this from hoarding that's you know, caused by a, a medical condition. And the hoarding symptoms are not restricted, so this is very important here, the hoarding symptoms are not restricted to the symptoms of another mental disorder. So if you have OCD, I'm gonna show you an example of this, how this can you know, form in a second. If you have OCD and your hoarding symptoms are related to your OCD, then you don't have the hoarding disorder, you still have OCD. Um, it can't, be, can't be related to major depressive disorder where you're just not motivated to throw your stuff away. Uh, it's not uh, related to delusions. It's not related to cognitive deficits such as in dementia. Um, and it can't be uh, just completely restricted to the interests that we see uh, in autistic disorder. And you'll be able to specify, if uh, this holds up, uh, you'll be able to specify whether it's hoarding with excessive acquisition. So this is where the person is actively bringing stuff, going out and bringing stuff into the home. They're buying things, they're stealing things, they're finding things on the ground and bringing it in to, to save. Um, and you'll also be able to uh, classify this as good or fair or, or poor insight. So how much does the person recognize that the hoarding related behaviors um, are, are senseless or are, are, are problematic? So here's an example. So this is Mrs. Ms. S.B. is a 51-year-old woman. She's experienced difficulty discarding items for as long as she can remember, although she did not regard this uh, behavior as problematic until it led to her divorce 10 years, 10 years ago. And her three-bedroom flat has become extremely cluttered. Despite her efforts to clear the clutter, she feels unable to discard most common items, especially magazines, newspapers, and paperwork, which is very commonly found among people who have hoarding. Uh, and because she thinks that she might use these in the future. One day I'm going to go through and I'm going to look at all this stuff, which of course never, never happens. And she also reports being sentimentally attached to her possessions, which serve as a reminder of the happier times when she was married, which is very common in hoarding as well. And her living room is cluttered to the extent that she can no longer sit on the sofa and only has one chair on which to sit. She's not been able to watch TV for several years as it's currently buried under piles of old newspapers and magazines. Uh, her hoarding has a major impact on her social life. She can't even invite people to her home because she's embarrassed. Um, and she doesn't report any psychiatric symptoms other than distress when facing the prospect of having to get rid of her possessions. So this would be what's now called, what will be called hoarding disorder. Currently, this is a problem that would often get labeled as OCD. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later in my, uh, in my talk. Now, I want to distinguish that from what would be called in the new DSM obsessive compulsive disorder, but just with, with hoarding uh, symptoms. <clears throat> so Ms. Mr. LS is a 37-year-old man, and since he was 19, he's experienced concerns about contaminating other people. So it's about contamination, and he spends several hours a day cleaning his house and washing his hands. So, so far, it sounds like regular uh, OCD. But his hoarding behavior started in his late 20s, he feels unable to discard his worn out clothes because he fears other people might become contaminated if they touch him. So he's got the kind of OCD where he's worried about harming other people in infecting them with contamination from maybe from him or from his old clothes. Um, and he also feels compelled to acquire any item that he may touch or rub accidentally in the supermarket or other public places, even if he doesn't need it. But again, it's due to the same fear about people becoming contaminated because of him. If he happens to touch something in the supermarket, he can't take the chance that that item stays there, someone else takes it, and gets contaminated by, by his germs, so he ends up buying it. Again, what's important is the, the function of, of the behavior. And as a result,